So when my, uh, my kids were itty bitty, uh, they're not itty bitty so much anymore. Uh, I love tucking them into bed at night. I, I just loved it. And when I would take my, I remember specifically with both Silas and Levi in particular, uh, we would go in there, we kind of had this routine where I'd tuck them in, you know, we'd read them a story from the little family Bible book. And then typically right before I, I you know, I would pray with them, uh, they would say, hey, Dad, we go, we're going to, and I don't want to mimic their voice, but just little bitty guys, like little, little tykes. They go, we're going to do good news, bad news. I was like, oh, okay, all right. You want to do good news, bad news? Yeah, we want to do good news, bad news. And it was always the same thing. They always know what it was. I was like, all right, you want the good news or the bad news first? And, and it would change night to night. And they go, I went to good news. And I was like, okay, good news is I'm going to get your wiggles out and I'm, I'm eventually going to stop. And they're like, and then they would just pull the covers up and they would just start squealing like in hysteria, just laughing and giggling. And then they would go, give me the bad news. And it was so cute, man. I was like, and the bad news is I'm going to tickle you. And I mean, I would just come in and I'd waller them, wrestle them, and they'd be screaming and yelling, blankets flying, stuffed animals going crazy. And I mean, they loved it. And then I'd do the same thing every night. I'd pray over them. I'd kiss them on the forehead. I'd always my prayers saying, and may you walk with Jesus all the days of your life. But there's always good news, bad news. Sometimes in our family, you know, it's playful when you do that. Good news, bad news. I can tell you sometimes in our family, it's not been nearly as playful. I, I know for a fact, I can tell you exactly where I was in Freeman Hospital when I had to take a knee. And I had to say, hey, boys, I got bad news. I got bad news. And I said, hey, guys, uh, I'm trying to explain to just really young kids what it means to say mom has cancer. Later on, after waiting a period of time that was, seemed like forever, you know, a couple of weeks, we finally get results, results back from Mayo Clinic. And then all of a sudden, like, hey, boys, I got good news. You know, your mom is going to die with cancer, not from cancer. Like, good news, bad news goes both ways. You know what I mean? And you've dealt with that. You've dealt with that in life. Tonight, I got good news and I got bad news. That's the reality. Which one do you want first? You want the bad news first. Okay, bad news first. It was pretty, pretty unanimous. I don't even know if I heard anybody said, say good. I'm going to give you both. But the bad news is this. Like, as geeked out and as great of a week as we've all had, adult leaders alike, every student in this room, um, here's the honest truth, man. The bad news is that hard times are coming your way and every single person in this room is going to blow it. Every one of us, man. Everybody's going to blow it. Like all these commitments you've made, how you're going to do life better, you're going to be so, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, like all of you, you're going to totally blow it, man. That's just reality. Like you're going to screw this thing up. All the commitments you've made, everything you said you would do, like, no, 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 man, you don't know how high I am spiritually, Jason. You don't understand, like what's going on heart. And I'm like, like, yeah, man, you can tell Jesus, like, no way, Jesus, I am never going to screw up. And I'm, I'm just telling you, man, the bad news is you're, you're going to screw up. Some of you, <laughs> you might not even make it through the rest of the session. You know what I mean? Um, you know, others of you, you might carry it on the, on the bus or van ride home. Maybe you carry it for a week or two. Some of you might make it a couple of months. But adult leaders and students alive, I, like I can just tell you, the bad news is you, you're going you're gonna to face hard times and you're going to cave, man. You're going to screw up. Your anger is going to surface. The addiction is going to come back. Whatever else, you, whatever your, your poison is, man. It's going to haunt you. It's going to come back. Your enemy's relentless. The good news is this. The good news is you can be redeemed and restored. Jesus is for all, and Jesus can redeem anything and everything. That's the good news. I want to tell this, and it can be kind of an interesting way for me to, 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 uh, to, to talk with you guys tonight. I need to tell the story of Peter. And you're going to walk through this guy's life named Peter. We've not really talked about him a whole lot, if at all, this whole time we've been here this week. But he's, he is a key character in the book of John. We're going to talk about Peter. But then over here, I've got to draw this parallel so you realize it's not just Peter we're talking about. It's also like you. It's me. It's us. And I'm going to draw these two parallels. We're going to look at Peter, but, man, we're also going to look at me. And we're going to look at you. And we're going to look at us. Okay, you got it? So Peter... How many of you guys have, have never really, you don't even know who this Peter guy is. You don't know much about him. Raise your, it's okay, don't be embarrassed. I just, I need a lay of the land here. Like if everybody's like, oh yeah, we all know who he is. Anybody here, you're like, I don't know who this Peter guy is. Okay, sweet, I got lots of hands here. Let me give you the background. There's a guy named Peter in the Bible and he's one of Jesus' disciples. Now there's, he's one of like an inner group of like 12 guys that hang with Jesus for like three years. They're the guys that, that basically Jesus is, you know, he's grooming them to take over. Jesus is coaching these guys, developing, and they're going to take his mission forward. Peter is one of the ringleaders, man. And Peter is the kind of guy that I would like. He's rough. He's, I mean, he's just a little crass, which I can be. Uh, I've already gotten in trouble for things I've said from stage. Uh, yeah, 
ask my kids what it's like to live with me. I say things that I shouldn't say all the time. Uh, Peter's the kind of guy that, man, he's impulsive. Uh, there's a moment where they come to arrest Jesus, and Peter's the kind of guy that pulls out a sword, and he goes to chop a guy's head off and just takes off his ear. Yeah, that's Peter. Uh, you remember the show? Is the show Deadliest Catch? Is that still a show? They still have that? Okay. Peter would be like a captain on the fishing boat on Deadliest Catch. And it, like, you'd always probably have to edit it a little bit because of the things that, that Peter would say. He's brash. He's loud. He's impulsive. Like, he's just, he's a lot like me probably. Um, and honestly, Peter's also a mess. He'll say things he shouldn't say. He, he'll do things he shouldn't do, like cut the guy's ear off. I mean, it's just who he is. And what you're going to find out is one of the three guys, so there's 12 guys, and Peter's one of Jesus' three, like, top friends. Like, you can think you've got, like, probably 12 friends, and then you've probably got, like, three that you're super, super close to. Peter's one of, like, the inner circle of Jesus' best friends. Like, they're tight. I mean, they're close. And Peter's going to screw everything up. Have you ever been betrayed by a friend? I mean, really betrayed? Like, backstabbed by a friend? I don't mean like you heard they said a little thing about you. I mean full on like they really did you dirty. Okay? If you're in the room right now, why don't you just go ahead and point at them? No, just kidding. Don't do that. Uh, we're going to look. We're going to start off in John chapter 13. And when you read this story, you got to realize like, and I don't want to say that like Jesus and Peter are BFF because that just sounds weird. But like they're tight, man. Like, like tight as guys get. I mean, they're good friends. And what Peter's about to do is completely, completely do Jesus wrong. You can see the text up here on the screen, and I'll, I'll show a couple of them. In John 13, Peter gets a warning from his, from his best friend. He gets a warning. And up here over in John 13, it says, A new command I give you, love one another as I've loved you. You must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Eric talked about that some last night. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Okay, he's like, what do you, what do you mean? Jesus is kind of alluding the fact that he's leading leaving them. And Peter's like, where are you going, man? And uh, Jesus like, well, I'm going, uh, you can't follow. Like Jesus knows he's about to be crucified. He knows he's going to die. And he says, but you're going to follow later. And Peter will. Peter asks, well, Lord, why can't I follow you? I'd lay down my life for you. I mean, this is a best friend talking to a best friend. And then Jesus answered, like his, one of his closest friends, Jesus tells us, says, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you before the rooster crows, You'll disown me three times. Ooh. You, you can see this one verse over here in Luke. I love it. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me. You will deny three times that you even know who I am. Like completely deny their friendship. Deny everything. Deny any association with Jesus. I mean, you can imagine if you walked into a party and like you see one of your friends and they're like, I, I don't even know who she is. Like that'd be cold. Like can you imagine if a best friend did that to you? Like you walk in, you're like, hey! And they're like... Uh, have we met? I, I don't know who you are. You can imagine what Jesus would feel, and you can imagine Peter going, man, there is no way I would ever do that to you. Well, if you look at it in John chapter 18, you turn your Bibles there, it's exactly what happens. Top plays out. You see this fall. And we'll look at this up here. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Jesus had just been arrested. Peter's chopped off the guy's ear. They're kind of following in the shadows. You know, they're afraid they're going to get arrested or whatever else. And he says, because this disciple is known to the high priest, we're not going to get into that. Basically, this guy gets Peter in, into the area where Jesus had been arrested. And then there's this, uh, this young servant girl on duty there. And she brought Peter into this like courtyard area. So they're in this courtyard. Jesus is over here. He's getting interrogated. He's getting like yelled at. And people are like asking him all these questions. And Peter's kind of in this, this little bit of kind of a dark, you know, courtyard. Just standing there with a bunch of other people. And it's a little cold outside. And this girl asks me, says, are you one of these man's disciples too? Are you? She asked. Peter replied, I'm not. Where's one? It was cold. And the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there, warming himself. So they asked him, you, you, are, you are one of those disciples too, are you? Like, you're, you're one of them, aren't you? And I don't know, maybe it's kind of dark and they're kind of peering across like the fire. He denied it saying, no, I'm not. No, 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 not me, not me, man. No, I'm not. There's two. And one of the high priest servants 
a relative of the man whose ear Peter cut off. You know that guy was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you just cut my, my, friend's ear, my cousin's ear off. He challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Like, I was there when you cut his ear off. That's what that means. I was there. I saw you chop my cousin's ear off. Peter again denied it. Three. And at that moment, the rooster began to crow. Man, Peter's fall is going to be really public. Everybody knows, man. Every gospel writer will write about this. The whole place, all the believers knew what Peter had done. Word was out. The 12 had heard what Jesus said at that last supper that before, you know, the rooster crows three times, you'll deny me three times. And all of a sudden, here's Peter living his mistake out publicly. Have you ever made a mistake that's public? Like there are times in sports, my son was playing baseball the other day and he's a good little athlete and he's in the outfield. And if you're a baseball player, you know the importance of good positioning on a fly ball. And it's the end of the game, you know, tie game. All we got to do, we're, we're going into extra innings. All they've got to do is hold them. There are two outs. Like we're now getting into the bottom half of the batting order. We're in a good place. Kid, kid hits a fly ball to Silas and Cy runs over and, and instead of getting like centered up on the ball, nose in the ball and catching it, he just does this. He just gets a little lazy. He runs over there, puts his glove out like that. Ball goes right by it, run score, walk off, game over. Like Silas came off the field just devastated, man. I don't know if you've ever blown it on a public stage like in sports or maybe you've blown it on a public stage in life to the point your parents know, your family knows, everybody knows your mistake. This is Peter right now. And in fact, he's so marginalized, it's so public that I love what it says in Luke chapter, uh, chapter 22. When he denies him, there's this moment that Luke records, it's really powerful. So Peter's right there around the fire and he says, man, I don't know him. And then it says this, man, I don't know what you're talking about. That's Peter. Just as he was speaking, the words were coming out of his mouth. Luke records it this way. As he was speaking, the rooster crowed, and right then, man, they're bringing Jesus out for some reason. Jesus hears this rooster crowing. He's got Peter standing over fire warming himself, and he's like, man, I don't know him. And he looks over, and there's Jesus right over here. And the rooster crows, and, and it says here, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. I mean, you got to think of that through Jesus, his lens. Jesus is over here. He's just been interrogated. He's been yelled at for hours. He's told Peter's going to happen. He's got people firing questions at him. And he walks out. And at that moment, all of a sudden, he, he sees Peter, who should be his friend, who should be his ally. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes out from this. He makes eye contact with Peter. And he's like, man, I don't know him. And all of a sudden, Jesus hears that rooster crowing three times. And he just looks straight at Peter like, man, I knew you'd do this. I cannot believe we're here. It was public. Everyone knew he'd blown it. In Mark chapter 16, verse 6 and 7 it's so public that here's what it says. When Jesus raises from the dead and they go to the tomb, it said he's risen, he's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter. I mean, it's even that point where Peter is like even disconnected from the word disciples a little bit right now. It's public, especially Peter. Even the angel saw this whole thing go down. At this point, no one but Jesus himself knows that he can be redeemed. And I bet there are times in your life where you feel like, man, only Jesus would know I can be redeemed. My parents think I'm going to screw up. My family thinks I'm going to screw up. My friends think I'm going to screw up. And Jesus sits here saying, no, 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 I can redeem this just like I did with Peter. They saw him fall and all of heaven wanted to see him get back up again. But here's the truth. Peter doesn't come back. He doesn't. I mean, you got this moment in Luke where they tell the story of a lost, you know, a lost coin that a lady looks for, a lost sheep that a shepherd goes looking for, a story about a lost son that, that the father would just like welcome him home. Peter knows the story. He's heard that Jesus can redeem anything, but a lot of times like us, hearing it and believing it are two different things. Like we can say all day long, Jesus is for all. But the moment some of you go back and look at pornography, or the moment some of you go back into inappropriate relationships, or the moment some of you get so angry that you rage on your parents, like, I don't know what your poison is. You're going to say, yeah, it's for everybody else, but it's not for me. I mean, that's where Peter is. He's like, man, I've screwed up too many times. I've blown it. He knows the stories, but doesn't quite get his heart. I love the fact that he was told in the story of the prodigal son You'll see it right here. On this side, he knows in Luke 15 the story of the prodigal son that Jesus tells. 
I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and earth, heaven against you. Like Peter knew, man, if he had just listened, that's all he had to do. All he had to do was say, Jesus, I am sorry. I've sinned against you. I did the very thing you said I'd do. God, I'm sorry. Jesus even prays that he'll come back. He said, but I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Peter doesn't come back. He doesn't. He continues to drift. Sometimes our sin can become so severe that it's easier just to withdraw from church, withdraw from community, withdraw from the things that need to be encouraging us spiritually, and we just kind of separate and go our own way and say, man, I tried it, I give up. It's kind of like the times when some of you tried to diet or whatever it was you're going to do, and then all of a sudden you blew it, so you just caved in and quit. It's like all the times you tried to stop whatever it is you tried to stop, and then you're just like, well, man, I guess this is just who I am. And Peter reaches that point where he just kind of feels like, I guess this is who I am. He, he forgot the fact that Jesus keeps his word. When he says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. He forgot what Jesus said when he promised, and surely I am with you to the very the very end of the age. I mean, he forgot about those facts, that Jesus will keep his word. So turn with it now to John chapter 21, and let's camp out in this text. Peter doesn't come back to Jesus. He leaves, man. He bails. And what's going to happen is you're going to leave here promising Jesus that you won't deny him with your lifestyle, with your attitude, with your addictions. Promising Jesus, I'm all in now. I'm not going to screw up. And the truth of the matter is, the bad news is, you're going to screw up, man. The issue is, how are you going to handle on the other side? Are you going to be different or are you going to be like Peter? Because Peter does it all wrong, man. Peter doesn't come back to Jesus. Peter bails. Peter flees. He runs. He goes off on his own. And you can see it here. Afterward, Jesus appeared to the, again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, also called Didymus, which just means he was a twin. He says, Nathaniel from Canaan, Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, two other disciples were together. He says, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we're going to go with you. That's a problem. We'll get to that in a minute. So they went out, they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up in the midst of Peter's mess. Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No. I hate when people ask me that question when I'm fishing. He said, throw you down to the right side of the boat, you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he'd taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw fire burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back on the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even so many of the net was not torn. Man, I can read fast, can I? You're thinking that right now, like, good night, he's quick. Anyway, uh, I lost my spot because I was laughing at that. Uh, Jesus said to them, he said, come and have breakfast. None of, none of his disciples dared ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to disciples after he was raised from the dead. He, here's the deal. This scenario of going out fishing all night and not catching anything, this almost mirrors exactly, not perfectly, but almost exactly the first time that Jesus ever met them. The first time that Jesus ever met Peter, Peter had gone out and fished. In fact, you'll find it in Matthew chapter 4. You'll see some parallels here they are really interesting. The very first time that Jesus meets Peter in Matthew 4, you know, they went out, they fish all night, and they catch nothing. I'll give you the wrong one, sorry. They catch nothing. In this text, part of the problem, leave that there, I'm going to come to this. Part of the problem in this text right here, I'm going to get to this, I'll get to this other slide in a second. Part of the problem in this text is Peter going fishing. See, when Jesus called Peter, he was a commercial fisherman. But in this day, he says, hey, Peter, no longer are you going to fish for fish. You're not going to be a commercial fisherman anymore. Now you're going to fish for men. I'm giving you a whole new career path. I'm calling you to something entirely different. That's Matthew. But here in John, when he says, I'm going out to fish, it is not the kind of fishing that we're thinking of. In fact, that word out means like a substantial total change. He's changing back to his old identity. He's going back to commercial fishermen. It's not like he could go down to the basement or go in the garage at your house, grab a rod and reel, and they're just casting out and reeling it in. It's not that kind of fishing. You've got to have boats. You've got to have nets. You've got to have a crew. I mean, it's, it's a commitment. 
Peter's going back to his old identity. And sometimes we do the same thing in this, in this story. We think, man, I tried the Jesus thing. I screwed up just going back to my old self. The last time they went fishing, I was telling you, in the book of Luke, they fish all night, they didn't catch anything. In John, they fish all night, they don't catch anything. Over here in Luke, they caught such a large number of fish, the nets begin to break. You see the same thing. It was full of large fish. You know, Peter gets out of the boat. There's so many like deja vu moments happen here. Peter jumps out of this boat to go meet Jesus. You know what the last time was that Peter jumped out of a boat to go see Jesus? The last time that Peter jumped out of a boat was Matthew 14 and he walked on water. And on this day, in the midst of his failure, he's not walking on water. He's doing the equivalent of crawling, man. He's in the water, crawling back with everything he's got. Because that moment when John says, it's the Lord, Peter knew. Jesus sought me out. Jesus came looking for me. Jesus wants me. Enough that he showed up in the shore on my misery. He's here for me. And guess what? He'll be there for you. And so Peter abandons his friends. He leaves that calling and he dives overboard. This time when he comes to shore, he's not walking on water. He's literally doing the equivalent of crawling back to Jesus. There's a lot of other parallels in this text that are pretty amazing. You look at Jesus and the Peter and this fire whenever they get to the shore. Do you remember the last time we just talked about it? When's the last time that, that Peter and Jesus met eyeball to eyeball over, over fire? Remember what that was? Remember what that was? It was that moment over here when, when Jesus walked out. He comes out of this place where they're interrogating him. And he walks out into the space and there's Peter warming his hands over a fire and they make eye contact. That moment, the last time these two guys met eyeball, over to, eyeball to eyeball over a fire, Peter was denying that he even knew him. And here they are around a fire going, oh boy. I remember the last time I looked across the fire and saw him. I was denying I even knew who he was. That word fire is actually pretty unique. It's only used two times in the New Testament. Just two times. There's a lot of words for fire. Tons. But this word is only used twice. This time when they meet on the shore and the time when Peter denied. That's the only time this word's used. They're standing there over this charcoal fire making eyeball to eyeball, just the two of them. And you can imagine the tension. You think about your friend denying you, your friend stabbing you in the back. And the first time you guys have to meet eyeball to eyeball. Oh man, I can think what I could do. Oh man, I'd be so ticked off. I'd be like, I can't believe you, you sorry, you know, whatever I want to say, man. I'd probably say a lot worse than that, man. I'd be like, you backstabbed me, you did this. And I wonder in that moment, like, what did they say first? What happens when you meet the very friend that backstabbed you? And there's so many other parallels. I mean, you think about all the memories that are being created right now. Like, they show up and here's Jesus with fish and bread. Where does Jesus get fish and bread? Like, how in the world, where does, it, where does he come up with that? But here it is. Can you imagine the last time these guys, every time they're around fish and bread in John 6, they're going back to when he fed the 5,000. And here's two loaves and five fish, or five loaves. You know, all of a sudden in this moment with these five loaves and these two fish, Jesus feeds 5,000. And in this moment, he's going to feed the very disciples who have walked away from their calling. And it's not just that, man. It's what he does with the bread. It's that contrast between, man, that, that last supper when they were last time with Jesus all together. And here's the bread, here's Jesus, here's, here's community around a meal. And in that moment, you see this tension develop. Because the last time you have this last supper versus first breakfast, this tension happens. Jesus took the bread at the last supper. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And now in this moment on the shore, he took the bread and he gave it to him. Can you imagine in that moment when he picks up this loaf and he looks at these guys who have just bailed on him. These guys have gone back to their old way of life. Like, bro, I poured, I poured three years into you, man. I gave everything for you. I gave my life for you. And this is what you want to do? I don't think Jesus does anything, man. I think Jesus just takes the loaf of bread and he goes, snap. And you want to talk about snap? Like in that moment, it takes them all the way back to the Last Supper because that's the last time he broke bread with them. Like there's so much stuff going on in this text. You've got to let the movie theater, the movie play out in your mind right now. Jesus cooks him breakfast. See, I think some of you think that when you screw up, that all Jesus wants to do, like he just wants to rage on you. He wants to go off on you. That he wants to say, I am so disappointed in you. You're such a screw up. And that is not the case. Jesus looks at these guys like, hey, fellas, you want some breakfast? Let's eat. And I love that part of the story. 
See, the bad news is Peter failed, and we will fail as well. You know, there's another for all that we've not talked about this week. We've talked about the gospel is for all, but there's another for all that we've left out. And it's important for all for us all to remember. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And like Mark talked about the other morning, and are, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by, Je- came by Christ Jesus. The bad news is we will fail. The good news is his grace is for you. His grace is for me and his grace is for Peter. I love what it says in Romans. Therefore, there is no condemnation. He's not waiting to rage on you when you screw up. He's not waiting to kick you out of heaven. He's not waiting to say you're not good enough. He literally says, if you're in me, there's no condemnation. Just claim my name. That's all you've got to do. That nothing, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you. The gates of hell cannot separate you from the God that deeply loves you. He understands your temptation. Jesus gets it, man. I mean, honestly, we all get tempted. That's the truth. We all blow it. We all make mistakes. Even Jesus was tempted. I mean, you find that right there. Because he he himself suffered when he was tempted. Hebrews 4, who has been tempted in every way. I mean, he knows that we're going to be tempted. I love what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13. No temptation. He says, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful. And then you skip down to the, or, the, the, uh, the yellow. But when you are tempted, he'll provide a way of escape. The issue is not the fact you're going to be tempted. The issue is what will you do on the other side? Will you run back to the Father? Will you come back to him? Or are you going to flee like Peter and just go back to your old life? That's the tension. That's what we struggle with. I love the fact that Jesus has our back just like he had Peter's back. Do you see what he does for Peter? It's pretty amazing. He prayed for Peter. I know a lot of times you think, oh man, your granny's going to pray for you. Your pastor's going to pray for you. Your small group leader's going to pray for you. I want to tell you that you have a prayer interceding on you that is way more powerful than any adult in this room. You don't need Moses or Paul or Timothy to pray for you. You don't need Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John to pray for you. Because look what happens right here. Jesus says, but I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. Jesus tells us the same thing. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. In Romans, he tells us, Christ who died, more than that, who was raised to life at the right hand of God, is also interceding for us. So that when you face that temptation, you have Jesus praying the same prayer, that your faith will not fail. May that give you courage. When you want to look at your phone or you want to do something in a relationship or you want to rage on your parents, may you say, the God of the universe intercedes for me. May my faith not fail in this moment. Peter forgot that. But Jesus shows up to restore him anyway. We're going to camp out in this last bit of text right now in chapter 21, verse 15 through 19. When they'd finished eating, Jesus waits for them to eat. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these. There's a lot of stuff in this text I could develop, but I want to camp out in that word love. There's different words in the Greek for the word love. Agape is one of the words. It's like this God-inspired, massive, huge love, like this unconditional love. Love. Do you love me? That's the word that Jesus used right there. Simon, do you agape me? There's another word that he uses for, for love sometimes. In this next word, yes, Lord, Peter says, you know that I love you. And what's that word for love? Say it with me. It is not this time. This time actually is the word phileo. Like you ever heard the word of Philadelphia, city of brotherly love? This actually is, hey, Peter, do, Peter actually uses the word that's, that's a little softer. It's like, Lord, you know that I like you. Ooh, you can imagine, look at somebody say, man, I love you. I like you too. Pardon me? Yeah, 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 that's the tension right now. Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more? Do you agape me more than these? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I like you. Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I, come on, Peter, figure it out. But he says, phileo again, Lord, you know that I like you. You know I like you. Jesus said, take care of my, sh- my sheep. The third time he said to him, how many times did Peter deny? How many? 
Yeah, Peter denied three times. The third time, Jesus said to him, remember, denial three. So Jesus will ask him three times. The third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you, what's the word for love, do you? Jesus does something really, something really, I think is incredibly kind right now. I think with a twinkle in his eye, he looks over at Peter and says, hey, Peter, do you like me? And Peter, man, just like every movie, you could write the script in your mind, you know how this movie needs to end, don't you? Like, there's a way this movie should come together right now. Like, in that moment, Peter figures everything out and he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I, ag-. what word does he use? Mm. He uses phileo. He does. I mean, we want him to use agape, don't we? We want to wrap this thing with a bow and make everything okay. But in this moment, he says, Lord, you know that I phileo you. You know that I like you. Can I tell you right now, Jesus does not need you to fake it till you make it. Jesus does not need you to put on a front somehow trying to convince him that the two of you are okay. If all you can muster today is, God, I'm struggling, I got sin in my life, but I don't want to run like Peter, so I'm going to run to you. And the best I've got today is, Lord, I like you. And Jesus goes, I can work with that. I I can do something with that. What Jesus doesn't want is for your heart to grow hard, for you to leave your calling. And one of the things that he's going to do in this moment, in this period of restoration, is he's going to renew Peter's purpose. Satan's number one game is that if he can't ruin you and destroy you and distract you, he's going to try to keep you from accomplishing the mission that God's called you to do. He knows it's impossible for Satan to outright steal your salvation from you. Satan can't steal that from you. It belongs to God and only God. So what he'll do is he'll try to make you feel shame. He'll try to make you feel guilt. He'll try to make you feel unworthy. He'll try to make you feel like you're no good. You can't go to church. Your prayers don't work. You're separated. His game has always been separation. It's what he always does, man. Make you feel like you're not worthy. Make you feel like you're no good. It's what he's done every time, man. He did it to Adam and Eve. He does it to Elijah. He does it to David when he cheats with Bathsheba. It's what he's going to do time and time again is he will separate. And good night, that's what he tried to do with Jesus on the cross. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even then Satan said, see there, Jesus, you're separated. But in this space, Jesus shows up and says, I can redeem anyone and everything. The bad news is you're going to blow it. The good news is God can redeem, redeem anything. And just like Peter, you're an important part of the plan. Because we have an enemy that's trying to tell everyone out there they're not worthy, that God can't redeem them, that God can't save them. God's plan to change the world has always depended on people like you and people like me. It's always been us. We're supposed to be the ones who tell that Jesus' love is for all and forever. His love is for all the attractive and the unattractive. His love is for all the broken and the busy, for the charming and the cheater. His love is for the damaged and the discarded, the easygoing and the hardworking, the forgiving and the cruel, the goofy, the talented, the headstrong and those they hurt, the introvert, the extrovert, the joker and the player. His love is for the kind and even those of you who honestly are just mean. His love is for the lucky and the unlucky, for men and women alike, for natives and for the illegal immigrant, the oddballs and the outcasts, for parents, for the quirky, for the rational and the sinner and the saint, for the tired, for those who've been told that they are useless, for virgins, for victims of abuse, and for those who've used their body even of their own volition, for weaklings, for warriors, for Xers and Zers, for people like you and people like me. The good news came that day to Peter. The bad news is you'll screw up. The good news is God can redeem it. And if I can leave you with that fact, that when you mess up, Jesus is on the shore waiting to put you back to work, waiting to restore your heart. 50 days from now, do you know where Peter is? 50 days from now, 
Peter standing in Jerusalem in front of thousands of people proclaiming Jesus. In the book of Acts, he'll be arrested because he won't shut up. Later on in Acts, he'll take the gospel to the marginalized. He'll be the first one to realize that the good news is for the outcast. Fifty days from this day, Peter will lead 3,000 people to Christ because of his preaching. If you came to believe that the gospel's for you, where could you be 50 days from now? If you believe that he can redeem your story, if you believe he can put you back together, where could you be on August 14th? That's 50 days from today. Where could you be 50 days from now if you've tr- finally accepted the good news that God can redeem your story each and every time you screw up? He waits to put you back together. The gospel is for all, for you, for me, for us, for them, for insiders, for outsiders, forever.